Now, now we're working properly. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to the UK Pavilion on, on Solutions Day. And we're very excited to have you here today. We're going to be talking about critical minerals as part of the energy transition and how important they are um, to this. And I think, you know, that it's perfect that we're doing this on Solutions Day because if we're going to be doing our energy transitions, we need to be thinking about all of the different parts of the value chain which will get us there as well. So thank you for coming. We've got a great panel of speakers um, here for you today. Uh, my name's Kate Hughes. I'm Director of International Climate Finance and Strategy in the UK government. And I'm going to be running your panel today as well. We've got live streaming too, so hordes of people watching us from around the world too. So critical minerals, we're talking about it today because they're fundamental to the energy transition. And the UK has recognized this dependency in our net zero strategy and also in our critical mineral strategy, which we just published this year in July. And part of our critical mineral strategy is to lead global collaboration on this topic. And so we're really pleased to be hosting this session, learning from others, hearing from a range of different voices today as well. So we're seeking to highlight the critical role across those supply chains and the consequences and the potential for decarbonization as well. What we can do in terms of improving the resilience of those supply chains and learning some lessons hopefully from each other as well. And to kick us off, I would really like to welcome our Minister for Climate, Graham Stewart, who's going to give us some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Is this working? I think it is. Excellent. I remember doing this live stream once of a reception held by the uh, British consulate in Chongqing in China, and I was a trade minister, and I was asked to do a, make some cocktails, a whiskey tasting, and they said there were some people online as well as a few hundred in Chongqing. And afterwards they came and they told me that several million had watched me failing to mix these cocktails very well, which uh, I, I'd love to think there were millions of you out there li live streaming into the importance of critical minerals, seeing how important it is, but I, I think it might be a more select audience today. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here as the UK's Minister for Energy and Climate. Um, it's uh, easy to talk about um, the changes that we need to get our greenhouse emissions down, but we've got to, we know we've got to do so much more and build more if we're going to do it. More wind turbines, more solar panels, more electric cars, and behind all this technology there's a tricky reality, which is of course we're dependent uh, on critical minerals buried in the earth to get the job done. We need lithium, we need cobalt, we need nickel and graphite for the electric cars on our streets and rare earth elements for our wind turbines spinning off our shores and I represent an area of East Yorkshire and we, uh, it's off the shores of my constituency that the world's biggest wind farms one after another have been developed and have transformed the economics of that particular uh, type of energy provider. And there's a whole host more for vo photovoltaic uh, cells um, need to do to generate solar power, for instance. And it's not just the energy that we can generate when storms blow clouds across our skies or when these clouds, I speak from a Yorkshire point of view, finally clear um, to let the sun shine through. The silent an invisible cloud that we speak of when we share documents, save photos or stream videos has a concrete and it has to be said less floaty reality too. The mobile phones, the laptops and data centers we use when we're uploading and downloading, they all need critical minerals as well. This is a reality we can't afford to ignore and as technology advances even faster, our reliance on these revolutionary rocks will grow further. Now, according to the World Bank, the world in 2040, so not so far off, will need four times as many critical minerals, four times uh, for clean energy technologies than it does today. Uh, but critical mineral supply chains are strained by this rapidly uh, increasing demand. The 10 gigawatts of offshore wind in the UK we've done to date, we expect to make, turn to 50 gigawatts by 2030. It's a revolution that's going on in UK waters and it's going on in other waters and deserts around the world. Um, there's no easy fix. It takes a long time to build new mines and refineries after all. And these supply chains are complex and opaque with a market that's volatile, distorted and fraught with environmental, social and indeed governance issues. 
All of the, this comes together to create a situation where our global energy transition is reliant, all the stuff that we're talking about in this vast um, uh, uh, COP, relies on minerals often concentrated in countries thousands of miles away which are vulnerable themselves to market shocks, geopolitical events, and logistical disruptions. But the world is waking up. Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine has highlighted just how important it is to know uh, uh, where our products come from, know the supply chains that underpin them. Um, we know that the risks of having too much concentration in those supply chains um, weakens us, and what we need is greater diversity and resilience. So we are committed to building supply chains which will enable us to deliver the, the energy transition, protect our national security, and kickstart the innovative industries of the future. Now that's why in July of this year, the UK government published its first ever critical minerals strategy. And it sets out our plan to secure our supply chains by boosting our domestic capabilities in the production and processing of critical minerals and building a circular economy where they can be recovered, reused, and recycled. But as in so many of the topics we're discussing at this event, we can't go it alone. These challenges are global, and we need more global collaboration um, if we're going to tackle them. And that's why we're here today. Thanks to the collective work of governments, businesses, and others across the world, including our own strategy, critical minerals are now part of the conversation, and this uh, event, I believe, marked a major milestone at COP27 in taking that conversation forward. The UK is proud to get their world talking, and I hope this event educates and inspires us to work together so that we can create those sustainable si supply chains for the future. And on that note, I will now invite the leaders from across industry and government that we're lucky enough to have with us today to share their perspectives. I'd like to thank them for their valuable contributions and to all of you who've come to listen, whether it's in the room or indeed the millions possibly um, uh, online as well. Um, I'll hand back to our chair, Kate Hughes, for the panel discussion. But I, I'm afraid I've got to rush straight away, but it is to an event on zero emissions vehicles. And of course, the mandates that we've set in the UK and that uh, we're working with others to have uh, set across the world so that we can drive the, uh, the move to zero emissions vehicles. But while we're sitting there, uh, grandstanding and glad-handing about zero emissions vehicles will know the real fundamental work to make sure that is possible is being delivered in this room. So I thank you all very much for attending. Thank you very much, Minister. And a, a good challenge for us there as well to, to really make sure that we are delivering on that too. So let me introduce you to the panel and thank you to them. So first of all, we've got Catherine Stewart, who is Canada's ambassador for climate change, where she covers Canada's clean growth and climate change priorities, particularly through international engagement. Welcome. We've got Mary Burst Warlick, who is deputy executive director at the International Energy Agency. Welcome. And Temba McQuanzi, who is CEO of Bulk Commodities at Anglo American and Anna Carolina Gonzalez Espinosa, who is Senior Director for Programs at the Natural Resource Governance Institute, where she particularly coordinates the organization's global energy transition portfolio. So a huge round of applause, please, for our panel. And we're going to take a, a, a couple of questions to them to sort of get going and sort of get the conversation flowing here as well. And I'm going to kick off and I think what you'll find is that obviously we've got a panel here with very different and interesting perspectives across this challenge of critical minerals. So what I'm going to ask each of them to say a bit about is well, why are critical minerals so important to this energy transition and, and what are the risks behind this as well? So let's come down the road. Maybe, yeah, Catherine, let's come to you first. Thank you, Kate. And thank you very much to the UK government for the invitation to be here. And just to repeat what Minister Stewart was just saying, we know that achieving 2050 climate targets is going to require renewable energy and clean technology, including copper for electricity grids, um, rare earth elements for turbines, and so on. And Canada has joined on to the net zero by 2050 with 120 other countries. And we know that net zero is going to mean two things. That 
global energy systems need to undergo fundamental change to achieve emission reductions and that this is going to require critical minerals to support it. And so we can't have a net zero world without clean, without critical minerals. And there's no energy security without critical minerals. So that said, we all know critical mineral supply chains are concentrated in too few hands, which is abundantly clear when we look at the prices of commodities and how high some of them are, such as nickel, palladium, and aluminum. Um, as a result of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. The current production capacity for many of these minerals cannot, or is not forecasted to meet the demand. Meanwhile, these supply chains are often too opaque and, and, and plagued with, with terrible environmental and social issues. So in, a, just in addition, some of the jurisdictions that are able to provide the minerals um, do not prioritize environmental, social, and governance, ESG, as part of their value propositions. And we need to change that. So now is the time for like-minded countries to come together and, and like we never have before, to build a secure, reliable, integrated, critical mineral supply chain to fuel this energy transition. That's great, thank you. And, and Mary, the IA has done lots of work on this issue too, so we'd love to hear your perspectives on yeah, these challenges and the risks. Very good. Well, um, just uh, building off what uh, Catherine has said and, and uh, what the minister said as well, I, I can only <laughs> agree. I would um, I'd just make a, maybe a couple of additional points. Um, that, yeah, there's no question that the uh, global energy uh, transition is going to become and is already becoming increasingly reliant on the availability of uh, critical minerals, uh, whether it's uh, batteries or electric vehicles or other kinds of uh, technologies. Um, it's simply uh, simply uh, going to become increasingly important. Um, and the IEA, as you know, uh, has always been very focused on energy security needs, and we're facing, you know, really clear energy security challenges today. But uh, for us, we think it's really important that as we transition to a new global energy economy and one that is um, much more um, efficient and lower emissions and really driven by clean energy uh, supplies and technologies that we're not creating, uh, you know, a new system that has presents us with new, really uh, uh, big energy security uh, challenges. Um, and so it's important to be thinking about how to manage those vulnerabilities now. Um, Catherine and the minister both touched on a few of those those vulnerabilities. The um, the fact that geographically a lot of these minerals are located in just a, a few areas of the world, um, the fact that, uh, you know, prices for all of these, uh, for many of these minerals are, are increasing. And so uh, we need to be thinking now, and I know we'll be coming back to these larger questions about exactly how we can work with industry, the financial community, and with, uh, of course, this is uh, a, a, an important starting point um, with the policy makers and governments all, the, all around the world. Um, to make sure that we're understanding what these challenges are and putting in place the kinds of policies that will, will really attract um, the necessary investment now and put us in a stronger place um, going forward as we build this new energy economy. Well, thank you. know, really interesting perspective there. And, you know, uh, let's come on to Temba because, uh, you know, it'd be great to get your perspective too in terms of, you know, what this means for an organization like yours as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, I think the case has really been made by the minister and my esteemed panel as to the importance and the significance of it. Um, I probably want to just touch on, you know, the scale of the demand that is required. Because when we think about a green economy, we're looking at a metals and minerals intensity which is probably three times more than the current conventional one based on fossil fuels. When you think about the amount of copper that is required, it's probably three times the current production levels. When you think about nickel, which finds its way into battery, battery electric vehicles and all that, 
it's probably in the order of about uh, six times. When you talk about steel as well, it's probably double the amount of steel that is, um, that is required. And if you then drill down and say, okay, for example, a wind turbine, how much copper does it need? It probably needs between three to six times the amount of copper per megawatt rating. If you look at a, uh, an electric vehicle, it probably needs about three times the amount of copper, 20 times the amount of nickel, and even an electric vehicle still has about 900 kilograms of steel. So that just gives you um, the significance of the quantum that, that what's required. The challenge though, from a mining perspective, is that while the stuff is in the ground, getting access to it is a challenge. And even though we have to be a lot more efficient, we have to also incorporate the concepts of secularity. That, enough, that alone is not enough because we're still going to be reliant on primary extraction. All that secularity will probably only account for about 8%, you know, up to uh, 2040. So it's really about how do we, as a mining industry, you know, employ the expertise that we have in finding these resources, being able to extract them in such a way that we leverage technology and we have minimal impact in terms of the environment, but we do it in a way that is socially coherent with the values of a just transition and ensuring that, you know, we create enduring uh, value for all of our stakeholders. And that, in essence, you know, is, is the approach that we have. And as been said before, you're finding that these minerals are in particularly uh, challenged uh, countries where there are issues in relation to governance. There's probably very little infrastructure, um, and, and that's the challenge. And the one last point I also want to leave with you all is that when you think about a mining project, as an example, from concept to the point where you, you put the switch on to get the tons coming out of the other side, that could be anything from 15 to 20 years. Now, if you then overlay that with the demand that we have, that's why we have the challenge that we have. I mean, thank you. I think that, you know, it, the scale of the challenge you've set out so well there and the timing, and I mean, for me, this is an issue, you know, this story about critical minerals is one which is only just starting to really be told and understood because we know we need to do transitions. We know we need to do just transitions as well, as you've um, mentioned, but we need to get it right too. We can't do a transition which is also then destroying nature, destroying social value, and not getting that right from the outset. And Anna, it'd be great to come to you and kind of just understand a bit about how you see some of those risks and challenges, particularly from that sort of ESG perspective as well. Thank you, Katie. Um, and yes, in the Natural Resource Governance Institute, we have done some research and there are many challenges, but we would like to highlight two. The first challenge is a possible surge in corruption. We have seen the experience of past booms and Transparency International uh, has identified that 70% of cobalt and around 94% of rare earths is located in countries that are ranking very poorly in the corruption perception index. And um, if we look how devastating this could be for research rich countries and their communities and uh, the, the citizens of those countries is also challenging. We are talking, for example, about estimates that uh, tell us that the DRC could lose around $3.75 billion uh, from corruption alone. So that's a very important challenge to tackle. And the second one I would like to highlight is social environmental risk. Because we are talking about um, critical minerals that again should be uh, engaging with um, improving mining practices. Um, although this would have severe consequence for populations and the environment. And we know that some critical minerals are particularly water intensive like lithium uh, that is uh, located, at least 65% of lithium reserve is located in regions that are already under water stress. 
and if we look into some other challenges in terms more of the well-being of the population, we are talking about a sector that has been um, identified by your global witness as one of the sector of uh, land defenders are more killed in the world in their report in 2021. So these challenges are very important and governance is critical. Well, thank you. So I mean, lots and lots of challenges there and it all feels quite daunting, I think, sort of listening so far to uh, this panel and, you know, where do we where do we go from from here? So I think it'd be great to kind of then get a few perspectives about how do we then build the right kinds of supply chains across the whole value chain that take into account these challenges, these risks um, through the mining, the refining, the manufacturing, the end of life. And, you know, you've already touched on sort of that circular nature, which probably isn't going to be as large as we might need it to be. So we've got that whole value chain. We need to get it right. How? How are we going to do that? And we've also heard about the opaque nature of some of these supply chains and the risks of corruption as well. So I'm really keen to hear a bit about that and then maybe thrown into the mix. So what does that collaboration look like between the public sector, the private sector, across all elements of society to get that supply chain working well in the way that we need it to? Um, and Catherine, let's sort of come to you first again as, you know, you're a mineral-rich country, um, but I know you'll want to do this well. So what does it look like from, from the Canadian perspective? Thank you. And I'm, I'm very happy to take this question because Canada does have a very long history in mining. And we have a long, long-standing commitment to, to doing it sustainably and also to responsible sourcing. So Canada ha is already one of the world's leading sustainably sourced minerals and, and metals. Um, for example... It has among the world's lowest emissions intensity production in mineral mining such as nickel, copper, steel for ma steel making coal and, and aluminum. And commodities, these are commodity, commodities that we know will grow, only grow in demand as we move towards more renewable energy. So our approach to uh, sustainable mining, um, it, it exists throughout the entire supply chain from from innovating and development to uh, mine servicing and so on. But I think our sustainability goes beyond just the economic considerations and includes the social aspect of it, of it as well. And so um, to be sustainable, we approach communities, in the, including our indigenous communities, in the sustainability process from the earliest stage because we need to secure social license in order to advance the work that we're doing on mining. Now, we are putting together a critical minerals strategy in Canada, and um, that will hopefully provide resilience to supply chain uh, and give uh, opportunities for increased trade. But we also, as part of that, will be enhancing our global efforts to improve ESG everywhere. And one key area to achieve that is through broader adoption of industry-led initiatives like the Mining Association of Canada's Towards Sustainable Mining Initiative um, because we think it's really important for um, us to go to a place where more midstream and downstream manufacturing companies will see the benefits of sourcing minerals that are developed in a responsible and sustainable manner. So we have interestingly vehicle, elect, electric vehicle manufacturers now talking directly to mining companies as a source so that we know that, you know, we have a partner. It provides certainty to the mining industry, but we also know for certain that we have a partner that can, can supply the critical minerals and that it's done in a way that's sustainable and, and responsible. So we ca we're building on that success of the, the e-vehicle mines to mobility approach uh, to, in the critical mineral area, exploration to recycling approach, which, which means developing capacity at all the different stages through the value chains, as I, as I mentioned. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I love this kind of, I hadn't heard it expressed quite that way before, this, yeah, the social license and making sure we've got that and, and built that in from the outset. So I'm going to be using that lots. Thank you. And, and maybe I'll jump across to Timber, actually, because... 
I mean, I'm sure you come to these conferences and we talk about climate and you know, environmental challenges and so on, and people think about mining and probably see it in quite a particular way as well. So it'd be great to hear from you how you kind of approach these challenges about the value chain, about making sure we are mining these essential minerals for our energy transitions, which will get us to one and a half degrees, but you need to do this in a way which is transparent, which is working with communities and is done in a responsible way as well. So yeah, I'd love to hear your reflections on yeah. that value chain. Yeah, sure. Uh, very happy to share. Um, I, I think for us as Anglo-American, it starts with our purpose, which is about reimagining mining to improve people's lives. Um, so that's really what drives us because it's about reimagining. And of course, we've ob we obviously are of the view that we have to reimagine mining in the context of decarbonization. Then within that, there's a concept that drives what we do because we're acutely aware that it's not just what we do, but it's what we enable as a consequence of what we do, which is gonna be quite critical here, is we have this concept called future smart mining. And um, the genius of it, I believe, is that there is an element which is around technology development. Like, for example, being more productive, being more efficient. Some of our technology development talks to the waterless mine, where you, you use no water or very little water. Some of the development talks to, because in mining, you have to move a lot of dirt to get to the ore. So we are developing technologies where we are able to go directly to the ore instead of moving all this amount of waste that's re required. Um, and of course, it also talks to technologies that are around how we are actually green in terms of our operations, like trucks, you know, replacing diesel, using hydrogen, like, for example, our new hydrogen truck uh, that we recently showcased. But equally, and in the same proportion, there's the other element, which is the sustainable mine plan. And that really talks to the social and the environmental piece. Because an element of, our, of that is around thriving communities. So we actually have what we call the Anglo-Social Way, which is a framework of how we should actually be behaving as miners in terms of how we mine, how we engage with communities and our stakeholders, and how we measure how well we actually do that. Then, of course, there's an element around clean environment and also being you know, a trusted um, a partner, partner of choice. Now, what's key in all this, though, is that we may well do well in terms of what we do, in terms of future smart mining, but there has also to be independent verification for what we actually do. And that's why since 2005, we started engaging with potential partners in this space. And in fact, we are currently working amongst others with IRMA, which is really around responsible mining certification. And we have a commitment that by 2025, most of our 36 assets will actually be you know, certified independently, maybe not just by IRMA, but, but by others. In addition to that, and it goes to the question around provenance, is that we have this concept called trace, which is really around how do you use blockchain to be able to get a sense of where this metal or mineral came from. This obviously started with our De Beers diamonds business, but we are extending that to the rest of the portfolio because we are well aware that consumers will want to know where did the mineral or metal come from? And that's why this is going to be um, quite important. So when you take all of that though, I do just want to say very briefly that it's also allowed us to really be at the forefront around what we do around renewable energy. We've just recently uh, partnered with EDF around providing 10 to 15% of the requirement of electricity in the whole of Southern Africa, where we'll provide a platform of about three to five gigawatts. And in addition to that, the hydrogen truck, which really builds on the abundance of our PGMs, solar and water, 
within, within South Africa. So, so we believe that that is testament to say it's not just about talk, but it's actually doing something about that in the way that we do it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, those points about yes, yeah, sort of that shadow that you cast as well, and how you kind of work and have a wider impact too. And I, it strikes me as well. I we were here yesterday on Biodiversity Day talking a lot about the challenges of deforestation as well. And the word which comes up again and again, and which I think is what you were just saying as well as that kind of piece about integrity and the independent verification. It's so important when we're going to be working on these issues that we are transparent, accountable, and bringing those elements through to the fore so that everyone can see what's happening and that's kind of I guess sort of the the private sector perspective and Anna Carolina we've also just sort of been talking a lot here today and across all of COP as well about it's this mix between government and the public sector and the private sector it'd be great to get a sense from you particularly around sort of standards and governance you were touching on this in your first intervention what does that mean across the value chain how do we use them how do we improve them where next I think it can be done right, but it requires an important commitment from different actors. And governance is critical, as critical as minerals. And um, we have identified in our research that weak regulations are actually delaying the process of getting to those minerals. And actually improving governance could reduce the process from discovery to production in two to three years. So there is an important agenda to be working on um, and governance goes from, you know, improving the way governments are able to collect taxes and ensure that the money is really entering into um, the budget of those countries, but it also goes to uh, contract, lic uh, contract and licensing, um, and importantly so, it includes bringing civil society and communities to the table. And we need to start thinking about communities and civil society as just the recipient of revenues of mining and understanding that civil society has a lot to share in terms of the mining policy design and decision making processes because we have learned just so much from past experience. Um, that means, you know, that different actors should be part of these conversations um, at different levels, here at the international level, but also at the national level and at the community level. And that would be, um, you know, my main recommendation in terms of governance being not only about technical processes and procedures, but also about bringing the people to discuss and to define policies together. Fantastic. And I, uh I love this point as well about, yeah, if we get the governance right, that we can actually speak things up. And we all know, you know, we spend also all our time here talking about the urgency of action. We don't have time to wait. So I think that's a really interesting thing that I will be taking away as well. And Mary, let's come back to you because the IA is working on a, well, has a working group on critical minerals. So this point on collaboration and bringing all these different elements together, it'd be great to hear a bit more from you about what that looks like and what you're doing in that space. Sure, happy to, and um, I, I know you referenced this at the outset, but just to remind all the listeners, uh, about a year, year and a half ago or so, the IEA released a report, report specifically on the role of critical minerals in the clean energy transition, and um, that uh, you know is an area that we'd been looking at for a while, but was really sort of a, a big flagship report that, uh, has, um, that catalyzed a lot of attention, certainly among our members. And as, you're, uh, as you've just indicated, at um, the, IEA, um, the IEA governing board and then at uh, the ministers at their meeting in uh, March mandated the IEA uh, to really step up its work um, in this area, um, looking at so many of the issues that have just been mentioned, but also taking a really deep um, sort of uh, look as a starting point at um, the kinds of policies that our member states are already beginning to develop in this area, understanding um, kind of the, the data worldwide um, and the whole scope of the, of the, of, of the challenge um, in, a, um, in a very sort of analytical way. And that's, um, that, that's sort of the starting point where we're at right now, the Critical Minerals Working Party that you referenced uh, which is involving, in, in the first instance, um, members, IEA members themselves, um, uh, has, uh, has held one meeting, and actually I think by interesting coincidence is holding its second meeting today, 
uh, in Brussels, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, over the course of the coming months, we'll be developing some recommendations for uh, the governing board and members to look at more closely. So that's just um, um, and, and that's just sort of the, the starting point of, of some of that uh, work amongst us. Um, we uh, we do believe that the IEA um, can, you know, has has a strong convening power, and it, so in addition to convening governments and not just our member states, but non-member countries are going to be so important in this discussion as well. Um, for goodness sake, we understand that's where many of the minerals are located and the resources are based, and we have to make sure that we're consulting with all of the necessary um, stakeholders, um, not only at the government level, but then as you've referenced as well, more broadly with industry and also with the uh, investment community. I'd just like to highlight two particular um, issues that we think um, really are going to require real attention. I touched very briefly on the investment challenge and uh, stepping up uh, investment um, in critical minerals um, worldwide is going to be very important, taking into account all of the issues that have been raised about ensuring that uh, these are developed in a socially responsible and sustainable way with all of the um, ESG. Uh, guidelines and, and commitments in mind, and so getting that right is going to be um, going to be very important. I think uh, Anna Maria had mentioned the, um, you know, or perhaps it was you, the the, the, the people-centered part of it as well, ensuring that um, um, uh, that uh, that those in, involved in the workforce in this sector are going to be able to continue to benefit uh, from it well as 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 developments continue. And we know that um, you know investment flows are not um, moving adequately um, to the um, developing world in the way that they need to for the clean energy transition. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times in other panels that the needle on that has really not moved uh, since the Paris Agreement in 2015, and um, and and so that's you know potentially a real challenge in this particular um, sector as well. And so that was, we'll have to involve um, the financial community and uh, governments and, and the multilateral development banks as well as we think about that piece of it. Second, we think that there's a, a lot of attention that needs to be made on the technology side. Um, we have uh, already, uh, bo both in terms of uh, the circularity and, um, and the recycling um, piece of it, so that these uh, you know, precious and important minerals uh, are, are, you know, find their way to to, to new uses and are recycled back into the system. Um, but also, um, we have found that newer low cobalt EV batteries contain 75 to 80 percent less cobalt than earlier generations and 40 to 50 percent uh, reductions in the use of silver and silicon in um, solar cells over the past decade have also um, facilitated, enabled a real rise in um, solar PV deployment. So looking for ways in which a you know, smaller share of these minerals will be required um, for the um, clean energy solutions we're seeking to really develop and, and accelerate will also be really, really important. Well, thank you. And I, yeah. And I think the only way we're ever going to get there in terms of those challenges is through that collaboration and, you know, and accelerating into those innovations and where we can use fewer critical minerals even better. We might have time if there are two, say, really quick questions. Look at that. Everyone's hands are going up. This is a challenge. Catherine, I know you might need to run off as well because you're speaking at something else at three. So you might need to run. Um, okay. Let's... We'll go for the gentleman in the blue T-shirt at the front. Please say who you are, where you're from, and try and make your question nice and short. Um, I'm going to lady at the back and gentleman over here, and let's take them really quickly, and then we'll come back to the panel. Yeah, so I, I hear a lot of climate activists. They just think they can snap their fingers, and we can go 100% renewables, 100% clean. Has there been any analysis on what reserves we have for critical resources and how much we could get to net zero? and how fast we could get there with the known reserves. Just wondering if that analysis has been done. Thank you. Maybe we can run the mic. Oh, you didn't have, sorry, I thought you had your hand up. Okay, in which case we've got, we'll take, well, who did I point out? I can't even remember now. I think I pointed at this gentleman here, sorry. And then we have a gentleman over here. I don't want to just take questions from gentlemen, though, but anyway. <laughs> uh, Chris Gentle from the World Energy Council. My question was just about, do we think that we've got enough people with the skills to actually deliver the, the 
five-fold increase in, in, in minerals you spoke about. I mean, particularly from an Anglo, Anglo point of view, that would be interesting. Thank you. Run it back over here. You can all get thinking, and we're going to come back, and you'll have, you can take the questions. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm from Australia, and I've got a question specifically for Themba and Anna Carolina. Um, we've heard a lot about different... ESG frameworks for mining, and I'm just wondering what, um, from industry, from an industry perspective, what can governments do to streamline ESG credentials and encourage practice to reduce barriers to investment? Thank you. Great. Okay, we've got three good questions. We don't have a huge amount of time, so um, let's come back to our panel and you can take your answers to those questions. Anna Carolina, go for it. Thank you. I think this is a very important question. And I would say three things. Um, one is I think uh, the international community and especially uh, importing countries should be raising awareness exactly as we are today about the importance of these issues and about how critical are minerals for uh, reaching net zero. And that's an important role, especially in these spaces. The second one for me, it's about supporting research range countries in getting it right. We know that important reforms and governance reforms are going to be needed if we can if we want to scale this up. But that requires a lot of technical support, a lot of financial support in terms like, for example, engaging in funding geological surveys for countries to be able to have more information about the possibilities in terms of resources, that's one, but also, for example, support for uh, setting environmental regulations. We know for our re um, resource governance index that from 18 countries that we analyze, only uh, in Africa, only 11 had environmental impact assessment regulations set. So that's an important challenge as well. And finally, I think that in terms of enforcement of those standards, there is a role as well for um, different countries and international standards to play. So how to include more concrete measures about governance, you know, there are already important social environmental requirements there, but how to ensure that more um, specific uh, recommendations in terms of governance and anti-corruption are included in, in those ESG standards, I think is, is another way of uh, supporting this process. Thank you. Uh, just to add on that, I mean, I, I think that um, certainly from what governments can do, permitting, licensing, re-permitting is a major issue and a major headache. Um, it takes far too long. And yes, while we accept that, there are thorough processes that we have to go through. And some of these are multi-year, three to five years. But you tend to find that within the end of that period, because of changes in governments and changes in direction, you almost have to start again. So, so, so that's only one aspect. Clarity around policy as well, and also incentives. I mean, if you look at what the US government has done with the Inflation Reduction Act, that has really spurred investment into the, 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 the sector. So, 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 so those ideas are quite key. On the issue of skills, it is a massive challenge. And it's partly because the skills base that exist is retiring. When we look at our pipelines, we're seeing less and less youngsters enrolling in colleges and universities to study in the fields of mining and extractives. And that, of course, becomes a challenge. And yes, whilst you know we are moving to digitization, artificial intelligence, and all that, that's not really enough. Now, we also recognize, though, that as a mining industry, we need to do our bit to make mining more sexier and attract because it's not also just about technical skills from a mining perspective. Given the challenges that we have, we need people from a broad uh, perspective, people from the arts, people from commerce, and people from all of that, and attracting people, particularly when people have to work in far remote outlining areas and all those challenges that are coming with it. So. That's certainly something that also government can do something about. Do we have enough reserve 
I rather use the word endowment because a reserve technically is something that you are absolutely sure of that you are going to be able to convert into product. The endowment is there. The challenge though is that from endowment to reserve, you probably recover only about 30%. That's the golden rule. Why is the endowment a challenge? Well, it's because you know, the, 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 the endowments or where the resources are, they are a lot, lot deeper. Grades are a lot lower, which requires more technology uh, advancement. And the fact that we've got to really think differently about how we think about the extraction of those minerals and the processing of those minerals. And then when you then throw in time for permitting and those processes, and then when you also throw in the whole issue around capital and the availability of capital, then you start to see that you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is a big challenge. So it's there, but how quickly we can get it to meet the demand, that's where the challenge is, but also that's where the opportunity is. The only, oh, hello? Yeah, the only thing I would add, just building uh, on what was just said, is I think uh, is sort of where we started, which is we know that as the global energy economy continues to transition, that the uh, demand for these minerals in this new uh, clean energy economy is going to uh, continue to grow and that there will be uh, a, a real supply challenge and shortage um, that will that can potentially translate into an energy security challenge that we really need to be thinking about now and uh, what's uh, what's what, what's important in terms of the value chain is not simply what needs to be done in terms of uh, investing in the development of the resource base itself um, but also in um, the refinery process, the value add process, which is, uh, is equally important from an energy security um, perspective. So lots of, uh, lots of issues to be looking at and uh, uh, I think a really timely opportunity for this discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid we're a little bit over time, but, and it feels like I know we've only just sort of scratched the surface of this such an important, a critical topic to talk about critical minerals. We're not going to be able to do this transition without it, but we need to get it right and we need to do it well and we need to do it properly and we can't solve you know, one problem and create another. So I think it's been an excellent discussion. Um, we've brought out those links to social, to nature, to livelihoods, communities, jobs, doing a just transition, the roles of governments, investors, civil society, consumers as well. And I think there's something about having both good supply and good demand and making sure we get both elements of that right as well. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking this panel. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot. I hope you have too. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about this a lot more over the coming days and months. Thank you.